Uh, good evening, everyone, those joining us from the Eurasia, and good morning to the Washington DC participants. Uh, welcome to the uh, regional virtual roundtable that aims to discuss the economic and financial consequences of the countries joining the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, we think that it is very timely uh, since we all remember that in uh, July 2020, Uzbekistan announced joining the Eurasian Economic Union as the observer. We also remember that in July last year, Uzbekistan submitted the memorandum of the foreign trade to the WTO secretariat. And in July of this year, the first round of negotiations were held. First, Uzbekistan is a big player with a population of the 33 million uh, people. It is the half of the population of the Central Asian region. Uzbekistan also is the second largest economy of the Central Asia after Kazakhstan. Uh, and uh, strategically, the Eurasian Economic Union needs these big players like Uzbekistan. At the same time, Uzbekistan has never been the, an easy player and with an economy in transition from inward looking toward opening a liberaliz liberalization, uh, still uh, about 70% of, of the economy is driven by the state-owned enterprises and the uh, customs tariffs are the highest in the region. Uh, therefore, Uzbekistan will unlikely to be an easy partner to negotiate its membership given it's a big member. And finally, uh, during the uh, summer discussion of the heads of the states at the Eurasian Economic uh, Union uh, Strategy 2025, uh, two other big uh, partners and members of this Eurasian Economic Union voiced their concerns over the decision made in this union. And the question is whether, whether the, the union needs another an easy partner. So I will stop here and uh, leave the floor to our experts. Uh, the panel members today, but before I give the floor to the panelists to present themselves, I want to figure out several technical issues. <clears throat> we plan that the seminar today will be about two hours. One hour, 40 minutes will be spent on the uh, specific question I will ask our panelists, and we will have about 20 minutes allocated for the Q&A session. If you are interested to ask the question, please send your name, affiliation, and question to the chat because only uh, webinar participants or on the only panelists will be visible. The uh, participants will not be visible, and I will voice your question after, after we, are, we are done with the main part. The language of the webinar is English. Uh, the uh, interpretation into Uzbek and Russian will be provided, and if you want to choose Uzbek language, please uh, choose Korean. This is an Uzbek language today. Then, uh, yes, I think that's all from the technical part. I remind you that the plan, uh, that the, the plan of today's uh, webinar is to discuss economic and financial consequences of the uh, countries joining the Eurasian Economic Union. And uh, now, uh, uh, with, no, uh, with no further ado, I will give the floor to our pan panelists. I will uh, allocate about two minutes to each of you to actually present yourself and briefly talk about the methodology of your research. On a separate note, I really want to thank uh, panel, member, panel members from uh, Kyrgyzstan and Armenia for joining us today, given these challenges your countries are undergoing in this current situation. Thank you separately. And um, now let's move to, to the actual introduction. Kasim Khan Kaparov, would you please uh, unmute yourself and talk briefly, present yourself and talk about your paper very briefly. You have ten, two minutes. Uh, because we are restricted in time, uh, I will have to guys stop you at a certain point if you talk too much. Thank you. So Vladislav, if we could start with you, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Kalia. Uh, so my name is Vladislav Nazemtsev. I am a Russian economist uh, who used to work and live in Russia for many years. I founded a special NGO in Moscow dedicated to uh, you know, futurology and uh, digital divide and uh, catching up development issues, which is called the Center for Post Industrial Studies. In recent years, I'm a frequent visitor to the United States and Europe, uh, being an associate with CSIS, the Center for Strategic International Studies in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I was asked actually to provide uh, a text about uh, Russia's position and Russian 
uh, actually stands inside uh, the Eurasian Economic Union. And so I don't have any specific methodology. I would say just for the beginning that my opinion, because I'm uh, looking on these developments for more than 10 years so far. So my opinion is that uh, Russia wants actually to use um, the Eurasian Union uh, to somehow to fix uh, its positions inside the post-Soviet space uh, to secure uh, its dominant uh, position uh, in this area uh, using some kind of economic levers for uh, purely political uh, obstacles, I would say, because actually Russia is the biggest, by, by far the biggest uh, participant uh, of this group, and actually it cannot get a lot of economic, purely economic benefits uh, from, joining, from, from participating in it. So uh, from Russia's point of view, I think we should say, we should talk about the kind of exchange of trade off of economic um, concessions for political uh, loyalty of uh, the countries involved. So therefore, this is actually the most uh, uh, most important uh, issue I want to address. Uh, as I see uh, the Eurasian Union these days, it's not a kind of integration organization. It's just a trade bloc, a custom union, first of all, because uh, if we, I, I will go into more details when I will present my paper. But anyway, uh, if one goes into issues like uh, mutual investments, uh, the idea of you know independent um, union um, authorities like the council, like like in the European Union, they actually doesn't exist and. Uh, uh, I wouldn't expect much more uh, from this Eurasian Union uh, to be something except of this enhanced customs union for uh, many years to come. Do we continue here? And uh, I see, for example, that, that Umida Haknazar is, uh, has joined us. I can ask her to re present herself. And in the meanwhile, while we're doing uh, settling the technical issues, so how we do, Kalia? Yes, please proceed, Umida. Thank you. Yes, Umida, I think you are, uh, yeah, please represent oh, yourself and uh, talk briefly about. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> oh, I can hear my voice. So, uh, uh, I'm Umida Haknazar from Uzbekistan. I'm legal consultant. And in this research, I participate, I, uh, uh, prepared it together with my colleagues, uh, um, Mr. Nisham Baisarajadinov, who is also here, present here, and Mr. Ziyadullah Parpiev. They're both economists, prominent economists in Uzbekistan. And I'm, um, uh, my part was the legal part and non-tariff barriers, and as, as I'm mostly, uh, um, I've been working on uh, trade policy issues in the region, in Uzbekistan, in Central Asian countries, and that due to accession process as well. So our task was basically to look at uh, what could be possible consequences or implications from for, for Uzbekistan from joining um, to the Euro Eurasian Economic Union, especially in the context of um, ongoing process of accession to WTO. Our overall, uh, uh, the methodology was straightforward comparative analysis because for the economic assessment of tariffs part, uh, we could not use uh, uh, widely accepted um, uh, model of uh, general equilibrium simply due to lack of data and statistics in Uzbekistan. So we just uh, looked at uh, basically comparing um, uh, overall, you know, sort of uh, descriptive kind of more even uh, comparison of uh, existing uh, agreements within the e Eurasian Economic Union and existing tariffs in terms of tariffs. So we looked at all those for freedom sectors, basically freedom of goods, freedom of uh, movement for goods, services, uh, capital and uh, uh, labor. And, and of course, in between there were some subsectors. My part was on non-tariff barriers, including traditional NTVs and plus SPSTVT. 
and part of services also and my colleagues uh, were doing the heavy uh, lifting basically of assessing the differences in tariff policy and excise taxation. So my major overall conclusion was that uh, obviously it was, uh, would be uh, much, uh, it would be rational for Uzbekistan to join WTO as all of the members of the Eurasian Economic Union are members of the WTO and actually joined it uh, prior to uh, uh, Eurasian Economic Union, except for Kazakhstan, which had this sort of um, contemporaneously, uh, which caused a lot of exemptions in the tariffs. Uh, we know over 2,400 exemptions, and there's uh, and now and we uh, from uh, listening to introductory notes of our our colleague from Russia, we can agree that uh, our conclusion are quite the same, that basically uh, it's not quite yet uh, really economic union in the economic theory sense, basically. <laughs> and there are no four freedoms yet. Even, even the first freedom is quite disputable and there's still many exemptions and there's no really freedom of movement of goods even forget about other you know aspects so this is very very overall uh, discussion and the next questions we can go into the details yeah thank you yeah, thank you, thank you, Mida. I just want to make a note that uh, on the uh, on the paper that prepared on Uzbekistan, Mida was joined by the team of economists and Nishan by Sirajuddin, the principal lecturer of international economics at the University of Lang Languages and Diplomacy. Yuli Yusupov, director of Center for Economic Development, Uzbekistan, is and Ziyudolovar Piev principal lecturer in economics at Westminster International University of Tashkent. They also present today and will be available for comments uh, if you have any questions as well. Uh, then uh, let us uh, move on uh, and uh, I, I don't know if Kasim Khan was able to set up his, uh, his uh, sound. Yes, I think I could. Great, thank you. Then uh, would you please present yourself and brief talkly about, talk briefly about your paper. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so um, my name is Kasim Khan Kaparov. Um, I'm not sure if this was the sound okay before. I'm a managing partner of the Economics and Management Consulting Group. Uh, we have a group that's based in Almaty, Kazakhstan. Uh, so group uh, consulting group. And uh, we are Kazakhstan and the region and Central Asia. So uh, basically, our research uh, was focused more on the experience uh, on the case of Kazakhstan's uh, joining uh, first uh, customs union and later on the Eurasian Economic Union, and uh, we tried to analyze what was the unique uh, circumstances for Kazakhstan and. Uh, uh, what 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 are the maybe universal things that could be of uh, use for other countries who are um, planning to join this union? Uh, just in a, in a nutshell, I would say that uh, the experience of Kazakhstan is quite unique because we were moving um, at the same time, uh, looking at joining two unions. One is uh, regional. Uh, Eurasian Economic Union and the other one is uh, Global WTO. So there were some uh, hiccups on the way that I would uh, present later. Uh, on the on the other side, uh, one thing I want to mention is the communication during this uh, joining process, uh, namely communication from the government towards business community and the population, and how the government uh, was managing the successful or not very successfully in uh, translating these uh, pros and cons of joining this union to the general population. Uh, I think that's one of the lessons that also can be learned from Kazakhstan's case. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, will, we, will, we, what's the deal? we will move on to uh, Mr. Vahan Hachatrian, who I see here. Could you please present yourself and talk about your findings? Yes. First of all, my name is Vardan Khachatrian. I'm Armenian economist. I'm a liberal Armenian economist. Sometimes it's very difficult to be liberal, but I listen to Vladimir 
in a sense, I am very happy to listen to you because I know you very well. And I many times spent and read through your books, articles. Thanks very much for it. And thanks to all of you organizers this meeting because we work about 10 months and nobody knows it. Uh, we understand that it's very difficult working with this situation, but thanks to organize for this meeting. And I hope uh, that our work today will be effectively effective and will all the able go to get the expected results. Our work is dedicated to the membership of the Republic of dedicated the membership of the Republic of Armenia in uh, Eurasian Union. It took place in special situation, which was somewhat unexpected for the society. Until three, four years, Armenia has been intensively preparing for the cessation to the initiated, initiated to European Union program of the Eastern Partnership. It predicts deeper political and economic cooperation with the former six country, countries of the United USSR, including Armenia, in September 30 of three of the 2013. In Moscow, heads of state, Russia and Armenia, Vladimir Putin and Serge Sarkisyan, agreed to the membership of Armenia in the custom union, then Eurasian Union. As a result, Armenia became full member of the Eurasian Union in January 2015. The board present the results, votes and cases done in the past five years to integrate the economies of the member countries of the union the impact of economy of the Republic of Armenia. The ways of participating in the works, the participants, the prospect of union, the objectives to develop. The necessary information based for the work was the official publication related to the Eurasian, uh, Eurasian Union, the analysis made by domestic and foreign specialists, the publications, as well as the publications of official statistical data reports of international organization. The works use statistical, comparative, grouping, analysis, and summarization methods. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we are moving to, uh, five, to the last uh, member of the panel, representing Kyrgyzstan here, uh, Kumanichbek Sagaliev. Mr. Sagaliev, could you please uh, then present yourself? Okay. okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Kuban Shpek Sagaliev and I'm representing Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, I'm the director of uh, local consulting firm and name it uh, Bishke Consulting Group, uh, Beyond Investment Group, and uh, with respect to the research. Uh, talking about the research, uh, the methodology consists of the three main parts. First of all, it is uh, uh, desktop review of all statistical data and second one it's talking the real sector uh, representatives uh, it's a big a large uh, uh, firms operating in the Kyrgyzstan and also SME representatives and the last one is direct person-to-person -person meetings and discussion with government officials in our research uh, we covered all four main questions and um, uh, we tried to cover all of them. And uh, the main parts of the paper uh, include uh, transition period, uh, uh, custom uh, rates, transitions, uh, about the development fund organized by Russian Federation for the transition period. And that's it. And uh, for, for these uh, four main questions, I will talk in detail uh, separately uh, based on this agenda. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And I know that, uh, that uh, participants of the event received your papers yesterday together with the registration, so they will be able to read uh, uh, the papers of each of you in details. And I really enjoyed reading those and learned a lot. A lot. It's, it's a lot of work you've done. At the same time, uh, we as Amcham also did uh, a survey of our member, um, members back in June 2020 on the 
to understand the perception of the business community on Uzbekistan joining the Eurasian Economic Union. And uh, it's, uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, the membership of the American Chamber of Commerce I work for uh, is diverse and we represent all kinds of uh, business. Uh, it's, it's biggest investors to Uzbekistan and it's also uh, small uh, local companies. So the uh, survey was quite representative with, with 100 responses we received. Uh, it it's represents all kinds of business starting from uh, in the consulting and the business sectors in the trade, construction, uh, tourism, uh, healthcare, education, and even art. And uh, also it represents all kinds of business, uh, all sides of business. Uh, we are talking about the uh, annual turnover from 10,000 uh, US dollars to 20 million dollars US dollars a year. And the number of employees varying from five people to 2,500 people. So uh, I'm, I'm not gonna take a lot of your time to uh, and briefly represent three main findings of our research. Uh, the first, uh, in, in first, that in general, the business community of Uzbekistan uh, perceives um, Uzbekistan accession to Eurasian Economic Union as positive rather than negative, and they have uh, three main expectations from this union. It's, it's improvement of the uh, terms of trade, it's availability of skilled labor, and it is eradication of the corruption and the red tape. And I'm gonna talk about these three main uh, topics just, just for the next two minutes. Uh, we all know that, uh, that, that the main concern of the, um, of the business community is the lack of the skilled labor. We are talking about the engineers and scientists in the different spheres. So the, uh, if Uzbekistan joins, joins, joins the customs union, the business thing that the, the availability of those skilled labor from the members of the customs union would be uh, easier to get and actually more uh, cheaper. So they, they, they expect it, uh, this free movement of labor that assumes by the integration. Uh, in terms of the trade regime, they think that uh, harmonization of the custom tariffs and, uh, and basically eradication of this ex excessive tariffs uh, Uzbekistan is experiencing none will, will make it cheaper and um, shorter to, to move uh, goods uh, within this uh, customs union. And finally, uh, very surprisingly, uh, uh, people, uh, the business community uh, thinks that uh, joining the Eurasian, Eurasian Economic Union will uh, settle their problems of the corruption, especially at the local government level they're experiencing and the red tape they're experiencing at the central government level. So the conclusion from our survey is that uh, the, business, the business community is more positive uh, towards Uzbekistan joining the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, but also that the, the awareness of the, of the business community about the procedures and the rules and how the rules of the game will change is also very vague uh, because we as a business community are not aware of any of any campaigns or education campaigns the government, the relative, uh, relative, related agencies do with the business community. Uh, possibly it's because we are still joining as an observer in the rest time, but uh, we, we, the understanding from the survey that like business community doesn't clearly see uh, the benefits or disadvantages uh, because they, they just, uh, just, they just uh, expect uh, that the business will become easy, doing business will become easy. So that was briefly about our survey and it's also attached to those participants who registered. Now I will know, I will move to the first question to our panelists. And uh, in the integration theory, the, uh, it's stated that the first reason for the integration should be an economic reason. So countries integrating uh, should expect uh, increased trade and the uh, contribution to the economy should also be uh, increased at, at least like by 4% of the annual GDP. We also know that usually the biggest member of the, uh, of the union benef should benefit economically most. Therefore, my first question goes to Vladislav and Azemtsev because Russia is the biggest uh, economy of the, of the uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Could you please tell us uh, on uh, how Russia benefited from the, from the creation of this economic union and um, um, about uh, trade turnover, the composition of export and import, uh, and about economic benefits of the participation in this trade union? Thank you. 
Look, uh, actually, I uh, my main point in my paper was actually a little bit uh, opposite to what you said just now, because I do not agree completely that the biggest member uh, gets the most, uh, the, the larger part of, of benefits, because if you look, for example, on uh, many integration efforts, for example, first of all, European Union, or North America Free Trade Organization Association when it was established in 1994. Uh, in both cases, I would say the weakest members of this alliance uh, benefit the most. For example, in Europe, we saw uh, that uh, the Mediterranean members, which were by far not the most important members of the European Union, like Spain and Portugal and even Greece, which joined in 1980, were the most uh, successful uh, uh, countries which benefited the most. Uh, for example, Greece uh, that joined in 1980, uh, it uh, improved uh, its um, uh, its uh, per capita GDP uh, gr grew from around 68-69% uh, of European Union average to 94 uh, by 2006. And uh, the terms of trade, the terms of Access uh, to to the loans, uh, the yields on on um, the uh, the loans uh, went down, and uh, this was a huge success for Mediterranean countries. In NAFTA, of course, Mexico uh, was uh, the largest um, uh, country which benefited the most uh, because of uh, of the increase of exports to the United States. So in Russian case, I would say Russia didn't benefit a lot from the Eurasian Union establishment. And uh, even Mr. Putin said uh, in 2011 in his famous article about the Eurasian Union that it should uh, produce around 20% of uh, additional GDP growth in the uh, coming 10 years. It didn't make so, uh, this, this result, didn't produce this result. Moreover, if you look on different uh, on different uh, parts or sectors of trade uh, between Russia and uh, other Eurasian Union members, it, it is rather not, not so big, uh, I would say. Uh, Russia runs huge uh, trade uh, surpluses with all of them uh, because it exports, uh, first of all, its oil and gas uh, or energy resources uh, to major countries like Belarus or Armenia. Uh, only a uh, little bit more than 11% of all Russian trade is conducted between Russia and uh, all other Eurasian Union members combined, uh, while, for example, less than 2% of Russian investment, which uh, Russian capital, which uh, is um, used for outward FDI, uh, is uh, pushed to Eurasian Union countries' members. So. Uh, if you look on some sectoral uh, uh, elements of the trade, I think the most important, the most, uh, the biggest share uh, in uh, Russia, which uh, Eurasian Union countries products has, uh, is the Belarusian dairy product, which encompasses around 8% of the Russian dairy market. But this is uh, a huge exception. If you look on the Russian uh, if you are in, uh, you know, in a Russian shop anywhere in Russia, you cannot see any kind of product except of some Belarusian, uh, Belarusian goods because the Russian market is very huge. For example, if you look on Germany, uh, the German, uh, Germany accounts for around 18%, 17-18% of the European Union uh, combined GDP, while Russia accounts for around uh, 86 and a half percent of the GDP of Eurasian Union. Uh, so therefore, I would say for Russia, as I stated before, for Russia, it's mostly uh, exchanging of some kind of economic concessions because uh, Russia actually uh, opens its market for Eurasian Union uh, member states, uh, except of the energy products, of course. Um, so it exchanges some kind of economic access to its huge market for kind of political influence, uh, or rather maybe not real political influence, but uh, mostly the imaginary political influence uh, over the post of its face. So uh, therefore I would say that I cannot actually um, find out any huge 
um, any huge benefits for Russia from from from, from uh, creation of the European uh, Eurasian Union. Uh, maybe there are some kinds of uh, you know uh, more openness uh, with the same kind of countries like Belarus. But anyway, uh, many um, many hopes and expectations that were present in 2012 and 2013 uh, as the Eurasian Union took, took shape, uh, they actually evaporated because uh, some of the Russian entrepreneurs uh, dreamed of uh, switching their companies to Kazakh jurisdiction because of the lower taxes and this actually went bust because uh, it's uh, a lot of uh, problems in Russia if you operate a Kazakh company inside Russia. Uh, the idea of creating, um, you know, a single market of goods actually was undermined by the problems of transiting. Uh, and so, if, for example, if uh, some Kazakh company wants to buy some goods from either Poland or Ukraine, it's a huge problem with uh, uh, shipping it through Russia because of the regime of sanctions. And the most important issue, I would say, is uh, that uh, the Eurasian Union took shape uh, starting from 2013 or even 2014, uh, and this is a time when Russia started to, uh, I would say, to close itself uh, from the outer world, uh, and the European and American sanctions were imposed, the Russian counter sanctions uh, were also uh, in place, uh, uh, have been in place since 2014, and so uh, as uh, I think you, Tatiana, said that um, uh, Uzbekistan is now uh, looking to for you know opening itself to uh, so for outward expansion or for outward looking uh, approach. Russia is definitely going the opposite direction. It's inward looking. Uh, the most celebrated programs in the country are the so-called import substitution. Uh, Russian market is closing uh, from uh, from uh, competition from different countries. So therefore, I would say that uh, I wouldn't say there is a complete contradiction, a, a conflict between uh, joining the WTO these days and joining the Eurasian Union. But in any case, I cannot actually imagine how big uh, the, um, the benefits from uh, Eurasian Economic Union may be. Uh, it's not. I would say nothing against it, actually, because of course, if Uzbekistan joins. Uh, and it, uh, it becomes a new member, definitely the Russian position will be very favorable for it. Because once again, I repeat, it's uh, mostly a political enterprise. So if, if mm -hmm. Uzbekistan joins, Russia will definitely provide some additional, uh, you know, ex uh, exceptions from, from the existing rules. And it will attract Uzbekistan and will uh, actually make everything uh, for Uzbek uh, colleagues uh, to make themselves quite uh, comfortable with, with this union, but nevertheless, it cannot offer too much, I would say. Thank you. Thank you so much. You actually just even, even uh, uh, look ahead and uh, partially answer to my, 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 my two next questions Sorry. about the business community, but it was really very profound and we understood that uh, even the biggest partners didn't benefit from the from the economic union. So now we move to the second big economy of the of the Eurasian Economic Union, which is Kazakhstan. And Kasim Han, if you could uh, could uh, please tell us about uh, how the uh, trade balance of Kazakhstan changed since uh, it's joined the Eurasian Economic Union. And we also understand that uh, uh, that not all members of the Eurasian Union are the biggest trade partners of Kazakhstan. We would really want to hear about uh, this situation from you. And you have five minutes. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, let me join uh, my colleague uh, Vladislav in his uh, uh, opinion that uh, this union was not, at this point, is still not uh, very beneficial to Kazakhstan as well. Um, uh, uh, let me tell uh, some points why I came up with this conclusion. So first of all, we're talking about the tariff levels that Kazakhstan's government has been um, decreasing gradually uh, in, in, uh, since year 2000. That was the 
uh, one of the main uh, policies towards joining WTO to gradually prepare the economy. And uh, but uh, then once we uh, the Kazakhstan joined the Customs Union and later on the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, we had to adjust tariffs levels to the levels mostly of Russia, which was a member of WTO. And um, in general, we could say that uh, the tariff rose almost twice, twice from 6% in 2009, uh, prior to joining Customs Union to the highest 11.4% uh, in uh, 2012. Um, so from this standpoint, of course, uh, the economy was affected. Um, the prices for cars, household appliances, clothes, footwear, that was mostly imported from China, Turkey, or Western Europe, uh, the price has increased significantly for the economy. Uh, this is also can be um, explained by the structure of the economy of Kazakhstan. And uh, in this sense, we are uh, very close to Russia uh, in terms of the structure of the economy, but uh, the oil sector is even more significant relatively to the economy in Kazakhstan. So um, when we talk about the trade balance, um, Kazakhstan exports a lot of raw materials, up to 80% of it exports and imports uh, ready-made goods and uh, equipment and technology. Uh, so within the union, number one trade partner for us, for Kazakhstan, of course, is uh, Russia. But uh, the benefits, um, if we could analyze the trade balance, uh, so we don't, we don't, we have, we cannot see the uh, direct benefit from after joining the union, because the trade balance with the largest trade partner, Russia, hasn't changed much. As of last year, it was still in the deficit. So Kazakhstan exported uh, up to six billion U.S. dollars volume and imported up up to 13 billion U.S. dollars from Russia. So uh, net deficit was around nine billion U.S. dollars. And uh, this is the largest trade deficit within this union. So in this sense, Kazakhstan is, uh, uh, is, is not benefiting from trade uh, in, in the, I mean, directly. Uh, on the other hand, um, we can see that the trade is uh, growing within uh, of Kazakhstan with the union members. In the last 10 years, it grew by 13%, up to 20 uh, billion US dollars, but uh, there was this trade is very volatile and it's mainly driven uh, by the prices on mineral resources rather than by increased economic activity among union players. So, in case of Kazakhstan, it's very hard to, um, to see the real impact of the union on the intra regional trade. Um, of course, the, uh, we, we understand that uh, the Kazakhstan's economy is not that big to use the economy of scale in order to gain real advantages and enter uh, at least Russian market, uh, which is 10 times more. And uh, that was the main uh, hope behind uh, government. Uh, join, joining this union, and that was the main idea translated to the business community in Kazakhstan. And uh, when it didn't realize, of course, there was a lot of uh, uh, a, a lot of double sort, second sorts from the business community. And I will talk more about the non-tariff barriers later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my next question goes to Mr. Uh, Kachatran because it seems that Armenia was one of these few uh, members of the, of the Eurasian uh, Union that was able to uh, actually export value-added goods, not, goods, not only like raw material, like oil energy, but you were able to, to export some goods to like Russia, like your cognac or all the luxury, luxury segment goods. Would you please elaborate on this and talk about the trade balance and, trade, and, and the composition, the structure of trade with the members of the Eurasian Union? Thank you. And you have uh, five minutes. And we cannot hear you. Uh. I forget. Thank you, Tatiana. 
uh, it's uh, that story of Armenia became a Eurasian Union is very interesting because the before became a member of the custom union Armenia during four or five years or three or four years uh, do very hard work with European Union for the, uh, the program of uh, Eastern Partnership became a member of this organization but then he changed his mind in 2013. The decision of the Armenians to join the Euro Eurasian Union was not only economically but also politically and above maintained a prorated safety. Objectively, Armenia could not act on the other side. On the other hand, it could not resolve its political and economic relation with Russia. It's a real, real economy and real political situation in Armenia. Why is changing the why the former president Serge Sarkisyan changed his mind in the 3rd of September 2013. Analyzing the economies of Armenia with points of integration processes, we note the following characteristic features. First, inclusiveness in relation to the Eurasian Union. Armenia does not have a land border with any of the Union countries. In the factual economic blockaded with Turkish and Azerbaijan. The second, strong, strong dependence on Russia. Third, small volumes of trade with other UAE members except Russia. For example, Armenia exported export of Armenia, for example, to Russia is 20, about 28% uh, of the full exports. Belarus, 0.7%. To uh, Kazakhstan, 0.2%. Uh, Kyrgyzstan, 0.1%. Significant uh, fourth significant shares of remittance from labor migrants and the diaspora, 15% of GDP in 2015. And five, fifth, thanks to World Trade Organization membership, there were significantly low customs tariffs with third countries in comparison with other custom union countries. And, structures and, and structural differences, differences with of the economic, economy comparative to all production Russia and Kazakhstan. Priority to join to union, there was a fairly liberal custom regime in Armenia. Import, import rates were 5-10%. After joining, another procedure was introduced, which provided for a differently differentiated approach, as a result of which the average, and average entry rate increased 2.7 times. At the same time, local producer gained an advantage in exporting goods and services to EIA member states, which increased their competitiveness. Experts of beverage, agricultural products, precious stones increased significantly as a result of the integration, light industry, agriculture processing of agriculture products, high technology appeared in more favorable conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we see that uh, that Armenia, in case of Armenia, Armenia actually benefited from the joining the Eurasian Economic Union. Now we want to listen to to the uh, to hear from the another, let's say, small uh, member of the Eurasian can you, can, 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 of the trade union of the customs union, uh, Kyrgyzstan. Kubanichbek, can I please ask you to elaborate on this for for yeah, five minutes? Okay, thank you, Tatiana. Uh, with respect to the trade balance, actually, uh, Kyrgyzstan trade balance after joining this uh, Eurasian Economic Union has increased. It is around three and four percent. But nevertheless, there is an interesting point I want to mention. Uh, with regard to this, uh, before joining this union, uh, Kazakhstan was known and was well known for its re-export, being the re-export hub of the Central Asia, because we had, uh, before joining the Union, had very low uh, custom rates for, for imports. And our country mainly consisted, uh, uh, was famous for it being like buy and sell country, like bazaar economy, simple bazaar economy. But 
the positive effect of the joining the economic union, the, all the rules and regulations of the union made, of, made the, uh, all businesses turn from the bazaar economy to production and processing economy. So it means that uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, began, uh, Kyrgyzstan has begun being and uh, uh, transforming to processing and production. But uh, nevertheless, notwithstanding these uh, positive effects, uh, Kyrgyzstan, frankly saying, was not ready to the requirements of the union. Uh, for example, uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, before joining the uh, economic uh, union, the Eurasian Economic Union was uh, exporting its raw materials, especially agricultural products, to main partner its firstly Russia and second Kazakhstan. But after joining, uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, had many requirements like technical regulations in Russian technical regulation. For these kind of uh, requirements and conditions, most of our business were not ready so they they like it was like an obstacle for our businesses but uh, to be honest the, it, it is from one point of view it is good because uh, this this kind it is like challenge for our businesses for Kyrgyzstan business business people so but again uh, another point another interesting point is my colleague uh, from Armenia Mr. Hachitrian uh, mentioned it's like more political uh, processes because uh, it's for a long time Kyrgyzstan was one of the uh, for Kyrgyzstan Russia and Kazakhstan was main uh, trade partners so uh, in, uh, joining this Eurasian Economic Union was like a formality so it's uh, this end for my first question. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we are moving uh, to the uh, to Umida. Given that given that uh, Russia and Kazakhstan are in the top three trade partners of Uzbekistan for many years already, and given that there is a free trade agreement between the former CIS countries on the free move of uh, reduced tariffs on the on the internal trade. What is the benefits of Uzbekistan joining the Eurasian Economic Union then, and how it will, how the uh, trade will change if Uzbekistan joins, and does it make sense at all economically? Umida, sound. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yes, as you mentioned, uh, um, for trade and goods within the EIU, since Uzbekistan, as you mentioned, a member already has been a member for many years to the CIS Free Trade Agreement. So most goods are subject to zero tariff anyway. So uh, with the exception of uh, the fact that um, excise taxes are applied uh, in a discriminatory way to many imports. So otherwise, uh, due in, due in terms of tariffs, it's a free trade agreement, right? So. Uh, the, the question is that the, the, there is not much expectation that the status quo will significantly change. So therefore, in terms of goods, the main concern uh, was is a possible change in tariffs for third country imports and that the discriminatory excise taxes will be removed. So that's a, a, a main question um, that we raised uh, and uh, that would impact, may impact, may have an impact for trade balance and trade relations. Uh, and by the way, removal of a discriminatory excise taxes is a requirement under all agreements, CIS agreement and under WTO <laughs> process and under EA, uh, Eurasian Economic Union. So for imports from third countries, it was established that for a large group of uh, HS codes, uh, such as heavy industry equipment or technological equipment, telecom products, etc. Now, the rates of Uzbekistan bound rates uh, would have to be raised to the level of the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, uh, which means basically trade diversion, since, since imports would mainly be from the um, Economic Union, mainly Russia. And at the same time, for certain group of imported goods, such as automobiles, electric appliances, food products, cosmetics, medical equipment, uh, etc., medicine, 
which we broadly call consumer goods. You know, Uzbekistan applies and has been practicing uh, discriminatory excise taxes for, for a number of years and used to be over 2,000 HS codes uh, uh, compared to uh, less than 200 domestic products applied before, but now they reduced it significantly, but still it's, it's substantial. So, uh, which, uh, and, and, uh, which effectively are hidden tariffs, basically, excise taxes. So import duties combined with excise taxes bound rates are higher than those of the Eurasian Economic Union for a certain group of consumer goods, which is uh, uh, so uh, obviously if uh, uh, the assumption is that uh, the, uh, if after joining the, if discriminatory excise tax is removed uh, and, and bound rates reduced, uh, it will be good news in terms of reducing the role of monopolies and state trading enterprises in Uzbekistan. But whether or not there will be sudden surge in imports from um, uh, third countries for such products that um, uh, following reduction and removal of discriminatory excise taxes, it would probably be premature to assume that they will immediately jump since we cannot ignore a substantial informal market of imports of consumer goods uh, imported without customs classification that's been going on since mid 90s. So it's probably premature to expect sudden surge of imports from third countries. Uh, but it's a specul specul speculation, of course, but <clears throat> just like with, uh, with other uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, there's also been an uh, informal market, but probably not as in Uzbekistan has been quite significant. In the context of W2 accession process, it's not convenient to rely, uh, we believe that it's not convenient to rely on EU region economic union bound tariffs as reference, reference points in, in, the, in the negotiation process since it significantly reduces bargaining power of Uzbekistan within the WTO, you know. If Uzbekistan negotiates something similar to Kazakhstan's exemptions, uh, over 2,400 exemptions have been negotiated from Eurasian economic external tariff, then um, the rules of origin for an internal movement of goods will be still significant then, which undermines the freedom of movement of goods principle. So that's what expectation of businesses that business will be easier to do, that goods will be easier to move, to transport, sort of is being compromised because uh, if the rules of origin are still a, a matter within the member states, then we'll have border checks, we have uh, all the delays uh, just as, as usual. So, but so these are of course at this point we a little bit speculation still because such because nothing is still clear uh, neither on WTO bilateral negotiations because they just started uh, nor in the Eurasian Economic Union negotiations negotiations so far whether there is a political will or decision on part of Uzbekistan to remove excise tax uh, discriminatory excise taxes that will have an impact if they removed. Uh, will be clear by December 2020, I think, which is uh, which is like in a couple of months, <laughs> because this is the deadline even for uh, the CIS free trade agreement. Uh, CIS free, free trade agreement also has a provision that Uzbekistan took a commitment into back in 2011 to remove discriminatory excise taxes as well as some other uh, and uh, comply with uh, some of the um, uh, international standards, just like other members of the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, CIS, I'm sorry, CIS agreement. So that's... Uh, mm -hmm. I think, I think uh, Umida also touched the second uh, question I had on the barriers to trade, tariff and non-tariff. And oh, then, okay. yes, but, but then we'll go the, uh, we, we will consider that you answered the second question and we'll go on the no, other. The non-tariffs uh, non I didn't touch yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's only tariffs. Okay, good. But then, uh, then actually, that was my uh, second question, and maybe we then start with you, and we'll just continue, oh, and then okay. we will move to the other panelists. If you briefly talk about yeah. non non tariff barriers to trade, and then it seems that both um, uh, Eurasian Economic Union and WTO has the similar requirements to the uh, to the tariff regulations, and then in this case, when we see that. Um, 
of the current uh, Eurasian Economic Union, almost all, with an exception of Kazakhstan and Belarus, all other members were WTO, were WTO, have been the WTO members prior to joining the Eurasian Union. What would be the most uh, plausible or positive scenario for Uzbekistan to join the WTO first, the WTO first and then uh, join the Eurasian Economic Union or vice versa? Mm -hmm. So for non-tariff barriers, of course, this is a very broad topic. So uh, since con considering constrained uh, time, I'll yeah, probably four focus more on, yeah, <laughs> focus more on, uh, on most uh, maybe uh, very actual for Uzbekistan topical uh, areas where non-tariff barriers such as SPS, TBT, since Uzbekistan is a producer and export of horticulture products, for example, to Eurasian Economic Union member states and to Russia, especially Kazakhstan, like fruits and vegetables, and it's an agriculture strategy developments to diversify exports and production of horticulture products. So SPS becomes very important, of course, within that. And there are certain expectations and assumptions that uh, exports will rise and, and increase and diversify and, and, uh, and ease, etc. So under the CIS free trade agreement, Uzbekistan committed also to harmonize its SPS TBT systems and, uh, to comply with WTO SPS and TBT by the end of 2020, but it hasn't happened. So, uh, uh, um, and the same is with WTA session process, obviously it has to bring into compliance. I must say that compared to all other member states, uh, uh, Uzbekistan uh, SPS and TBT systems are quite uh, uh, under, underdeveloped uh, at a rudimentary stage. Maybe it has to do with the fact that over the past 30 years, Uzbekistan hasn't been really trading well and has been isolated sort of from international standards, let's say, yeah? so. Eurasian Economic Union SPS and TBT agreements are based on WTSPS primarily principles in most part, although there are some differences and not all technical regulations and SPS measures on the Eurasian Economic Union are fully harmonized with international standards like Codex, OAE, and IPPC. However, it's still more WTO based, of course, compared to Uzbekistan. So therefore, Uzbekistan will still need to do its homework, you know, of reforming the SPS and TBT system. Here I can refer to my colleague from Kyrgyzstan who said that on the one hand, it's good that for Kyrgyzstan that it had to kind of, you know, comply and change and make some reforms to move closer, you know, to international standards. And, and maybe that's also the same argument for us that maybe it's good so at least something we have to we have to start doing, you know. But uh, for example, on food safety, Uzbekistan not only restricted imports over the past like 20 years, but also banned export, which is quite paradoxical on food products, on animal origins, for example, meat and milk products. So Uzbekistan has been, as I said, isolated from international standards and, and legislation is not risk-based, no harmonized institutions are fragmented, huge overlap at the same of functions, at the same time, many loopholes, so no control over very important um, uh, agricultural inputs like use and sale of pesticides, wet drugs, animal feed and fertilizers, something which is very important for exports of horticulture products, you know, especially if we're talking to uh, exports to EU member states or some developed countries, they really look at, look at this residual levels, you know, MRLs, you know, according to Codex. Uh, and there's no really effective uh, inspection of food operators and no modernization of labs. There is no single lab that is uh, internationally accredited. Uzbekistan is not a member to ILAC, which is International Board Accreditation Corporation. So, uh, and of course, all these best practices like from farm to table, GMP, GHP, HASP, it's never been introduced, et cetera, et cetera. So on TBT, there's a huge conflict of interest because the, we still have standards agency that combines all these functions, you know, certification, accreditation, standardization, technical regulation. Uh, and, and some of the, and, uh, and uh, still focused on end product certification rather than new approach of process-based, risk-based, you know, uh, control. So we can uh, basically uh, conclude, uh, to put it shortly, that under the EU, uh, for exporting to EU regional economic member states, uh, like labs must be included into the list of the EU regional economic union labs like food enterprises that produce products for export, they must be included into the register of EAU, you know, and they have to comply with HASP and many other 
things and they would be subject to inspections from veterinaries from Russia or Kazakhstan or whatever member states. So, uh, and at the same time, there are problems with the EU legislation as well, because there is no reliable enforcement on the Eurasian Economic Union regulations at the national level. So there is a risk that there may, there may be different rules within different member states in terms of actually border checks even, you know? So no really unified policy. All the agreement is the same, principles apply the same, but enforcement level, there is a two tier kind of level of regulation. So for, as for imports, what the expectations is that of course, well, maybe there may be increase uh, in imports of processed foods like uh, processed meat and milk products from Belarus, Kazakhstan, Russia, Kyrgyzstan, you know, we can say maybe there, we, there is assumption, of course, that it will be good for competition in Uzbekistan, you know, so that it will kind of um, stimulate local producers to, to make better products. But the question is how reform will go for domestic systems. If reform do not really progress on these issues, then the competition will not be even possible because even importers would have to deal with the national level enforcement level. So it depends on how the, the domestically, you know, the reforms will move. Uh, therefore, uh, it's kind of too, uh, I would agree that this is, a, this, is, this is the area which is least developed in Uzbekistan, probably least sort of backwards <laughs> compared to all the member, Eurasian economic member states. And, uh, and definitely the Eurasian economic union agreements and regulations are much more WTO based and international standards based, of course, than Uzbekistan. And on the one hand, it's a good thing to, uh, to force, you know, domestic reforms. But whether or not there will be domestic reforms, that's a question because this is a, a shortcoming of the Eurasian Economic Union <laughs> regulations and a system that it's a two level regulation, a two tier kind of enforcement and, uh, and, and it all goes to enforcement all lies within the national level. So there is a risk that uh, member states will not have political power, you know, to force Uzbekistan to do the domestic reforms basically. So, of course, from Thank you, practical, <laughs> and just your last, last point, from the practical point of view, of course, it would be much more rational to join WTO because within the WTO commitments, there is much more, liver, uh, more, uh, more pressure, you know, to do their domestic reforms. Thank you, thank you, Mida. And then uh, you mentioned this expert of agricultural and, uh, and the uh, requirements. I want I wanted to ask the Kumanich uh, back to elaborate on this because in this paper I, I saw that uh, when uh, Kyrgyzstan joined the Eurasian Economic Union, the Russia somehow assisted with the laboratories, so the uh, so you were, were able to catch up as an expert of the agricultural products to Russia. Uh, could uh, in in addition, uh, Kyrgyzstan al along with Armenia were the earliest members of WTO, so I think the negotiation of the of the non-trade non and non-tariff non and tariff uh, barriers to trade, like were well, like smooth and, and quicker. Could you please uh, briefly talk about this four minutes you have? Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, talking about the Kyrgyzstan, about this uh, being the prepared for the union is as follows. In the, uh, in the beginning of this, our uh, webinar, my colleague from Kazakhstan, um, Mr. Kasumkhan told that uh, the main part uh, of uh, joining the process was communication. Communication and negotiations, it's the key part of entering this union. And you know, uh, interesting part uh, of, this, of the process was not, uh, it's like opposite from uh, Uzbekistan as you told before, that our business associations uh, more specified business association, all, uh, almost all business associations were challenging the government in order, in order that government uh, conducted these information, informative campaigns around for, for the whole country. So in Kyrgyzstan, particularly, the government was, was really working hard in order to make clear information about the joining, about the peculiarities, uh, about differentiation of being the member of the member of the union talking about this uh, uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers uh, is uh, i want to again mention that uh, kyrgyzstan was not prepared for being the member 
because it was more like our economy was like only procuring the main trade partner Russia and Kazakhstan with the raw materials. And mostly was re-exporting the all the goods coming from China. But after joining the union, uh, custom uh, tariffs, custom customs rates were increased uh, significantly for our country. And after that, Kyrgyzstan uh, had no chance. It it had only chance to make its own production and to make own processing. Uh, direction for the businesses so having this kind of uh, reorientation of the business business it was like uh, it was like going from bazaar economy to this uh, processing and uh, production economy there is uh, i want to mention one point that uh, kyrgyzstan had uh, transition period for certain uh, uh, goods and uh, for certain goods and materials like uh, even if, uh, for example there are lots of many uh, products and goods and uh, materials that are not produced in kyrgyzstan for the for such kind of products kyrgyzstan had a transition period for three years four years and for five years uh, and also these technical requirements uh, in the russian technical regulament most of the business were not ready for it so uh, kyrgyzstan until now until now there are they have been witness and all the businesses have been witnessing witnessing these kind of obstacles while uh, making trades with kazakhstan with russia with belarus because all the goods provo uh, procured from kyrgyzstan are not uh, are not in uh, are not in compliance with this kind of uh, requirements with eurasian economic union requirements another thing it is unofficially, I heard from may, many businesses, many small businesses, many large businesses, there is uh, unofficially, there are lots of barriers from Russian side, from Kazakhstan side. Like, you know that every country wants to have its own pie. And the same uh, uh, with respect to this uh, Kyrgyzstan produced processed goods, there is like a, a, a un, unofficial barriers entering these goods into these large markets like uh, uh, Russia and Kazakhstan. So that's it. Thank you. Response. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we will move on to the uh, on this uh, uh, barriers to trade uh, and uh, barriers to trade and double to accession to the next uh, panel panel member, Mr. Kachatrian, if you could please tell us on, uh, on, the, uh, on the process of accession, because I know that Armenia also was the member of WTO when, they, when you joined, and you were not actually going to join the Eurasian Economic Union, so your, your barriers to trade were much lower comparing to, the, to that in the, within the Eurasian Economic Union. How did you negotiate this? Tatiana, thank you. You are right. Armenia became a member of WTO in 2003, 2003, 70 years. It's oldest member of this union members. But it's very, when Armenia decided became the Eurasian Union, one of the main question, what we'll do in this situation, because Armenia, I uh, introduce you, that was the Armenian trade regime is, was, was very liberal, more liberal regime, and the import tariff was about five, five maximum 10%. But after they became of the Eurasian Union, we understand that uh, tariffs will be increased, and uh, after them, the situation in the economic, economic situation will be changed because the uh, infl we're talking, uh, we're thinking about inflation, about rising the price of the goods and some other things. And it was very difficult, it was a very in, uh, difficult situation in that time. I mean, five years ago when we were discussing with experts, with politicals, what will do Armenian doing with this situation? Because we have a special agreement with WTO uh, that uh, we will, uh, our uh, tariffs will, will never be changed. But uh, during these five years, we haven't any problem with WTO until now. 
I can't say about uh, after because we, uh, we I, I, when I spoke with the officials from Eurasian commissions, uh, they asked me that uh, they have a special union, Eurasian Union have a special agreement with WTO uh, and they discussion about the situation. If Armenians deciding rising is uh, some of uh, tariffs of some of goods, there will be discussion with uh, officials from WTO. And after then, uh, uh, Armenia and maybe uh, not only Armenia and officials from Eurasian Union we decided what they will, what they shall do. It is the uh, they asked me this uh, when I asked the question they answered me this. It is the situation and in this situation Armenia now have a special agreement with uh, Eurasian Union that during uh, five years I mean in from 2015 until 2020 certain goods could be imported into the Armenian under the same conditions it was before and there was also a list of tariff preferences and exceptions from the uh, Eurasian Commission that is list of goods that will be important at lower or higher rates for a certain number of years and rates of import custom duties which are comfortable for, comfortable for Armenia we retain for such commodity goods groups of motor vehicles and vehicles food products pharmatics, oil products, and uh, other things. In terms of technical regulation, it's very important for Armenia too. A rule was enforced during the year according to which Armenian entrepreneur received the right to choose to work either in accordance with the legislation of the uh, 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 Eurasian Union or in accordance with the national legislation. It was a very difficult uh, problem in that time, but they, after the, some discussion between, between interpreters from Armenia and officials from Eurasian Union, they agreed that it, uh, that it will be worked with this, uh, I explained you. And other question was uh, uh, very important for Armenia is the labor migration, migrants problem. Because uh, I introduced you that about 15% of uh, remittance coming from 15 percent uh, remittance of GDP uh, and mostly of they coming from Russia and Armenian citizens without any restrictions could work on the territory of the entire Union as well as stay in the territory of uh, Eurasian Union countries for 30 days without registration under a label agreement but now this restriction has now been lifted it means that Armenian workers can work in any countries of U uh, Eurasian Union, any how they will, how many days they want, and how it's no problem. It's the same. It's the same situation if they decided to work in Armenia. It's very important for. I think it will be very important for uh, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan uh, because I know that many of uh, migrants work in Russia from their countries too. Yeah, thank you. I think it's the situation with migrant workers and they, uh, the number of remittances they remit to the economy of our countries is huge, uh, be it the share of the GDP or the uh, in, in absolute terms. And uh, yes, my, uh, the migrant workers is the biggest reason for most of the countries to join the Eurasian Economic Union. However, uh, we, we we move on, and uh, now we, uh, we 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 have two big economies to to answer the question on the on the tariffs and on tariffs. It's Kyrgyz it's Kazakhstan and actually Russia, and also we we learn from the first first question that the composition of the export of goods uh, is is almost the, the same. Uh, my question to Vladislav and Azemsov on how the Russia was negotiating those um, or imposing those uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade to other uh, members of the Union. Please, uh, could you comment? Look, uh, the Russian case is quite unique here because as uh, everybody uh, before stated already, that the Russian tariffs were higher uh, than uh, the most of the countries who were previously WTO members. So therefore, actually, Russia didn't negotiate, I would say, something like this. It just stated that uh, it will um, apply the same kind of tariffs, maybe a little bit lower than, before, uh, than they were. 
uh, to all other countries. And uh, of course, uh, all other members of the W of the Eurasian Union agreed to join uh, quite willingly. Uh, and um, uh, as they understood uh, that the tariffs will rise, but nevertheless, uh, they, uh, as I believe, they uh, calculated that other preferences that uh, the, the membership can offer will outweigh uh, this, uh, this uh, tariff hike. Uh, the problem with the tariffs and non-tariff regulation is actually that uh, the bodies, the collective bodies of the Eurasian Union are quite weak. Uh, and uh, as the media once mentioned, uh, the decision-making process is not so efficient and is not so independent as, for example, in the European Union, because uh, even the court uh, of the Eurasian Union has only uh, the possibility to, uh, you know, to draft some um, decisions which uh, doesn't have any uh, immediate power uh, to be implemented is just uh, a kind of um, a kind of recommendation, uh, not nothing else. And therefore, actually, uh, the Commission of the region in itself not very powerful uh, if compared, for example, to the European Commission, because every important decision uh, should be made by the consensus between the heads of state and all the government. Of the European Union, uh, of the Asian Union. So therefore, it's not very effective mechanism actually. So uh, and what I also want to mention here is that in Russia, the technical standards, as um, our Kyrgyz colleague mentioned, uh, they actually are not very um, uh, not very advanced uh, compared to the European ones and even to the Chinese. So therefore, uh, the Russian market to adopt to the Russian market, you should actually a little bit, you know, downgrade your own requirements. And it was a huge case with Kazakhstan because many requirements that Kazakhstan had at the start, at the time it joined the Eurasian Union were actually the same as the European Union. And it creates a lot of problems. Moreover, uh, I would also say that actually the problem with the Eurasian Union country economies uh, is that most of them, I think, only except of Kyrgyz and maybe in Armenian economy, they, are, uh, they have a very huge presence of a state sector. Uh, in Russia, it's around uh, 65 to 70% of the state sector presence in the economy. In Belarus case, it's close to 80%. And the problem is that uh, one of the most important sectors uh, in Russian and Belarusian economy, I, I think in Kazakh economy as well, uh, is the supply of services and goods to the state and or to the state-owned corporations. And this sector is also, I would say, not entirely closed for the competition, but the competition here is limited. So there were a lot of quarrels between Russia and Belarus when the Belarusian companies, for example, um, Minsk tractor factory or Gomel factory for uh, agricultural equipment, they tried to be included into the Russian, what is called Gozakas or state order, uh, and uh, they failed actually to infiltrate in this kind of, uh, of transactions. So this, all these questions are quite of uh, huge importance. Moreover, I would say, that for example, if you uh, look on Kazakhstan, on Kazakh, for example, fuel market or gasoline market, it's also much more liberalized than in Russia. And I would say that uh, the difference, the price differentials, uh, differentials between um, uh, Kazakh market uh, for gasoline uh, and uh, the Russian market is huge. And actually what the Russians were doing for years was a, a postponement from one year to another year of uh, introduction of a free market for uh, energy resources. And this is actually a very, very acute problem because the Kazakh uh, companies can benefit a lot of uh, supplying the Kazakh gasoline or diesel to Orenburg Oblast, to uh, Western Siberia, or to Southern Europe and whatsoever. So uh, in any case, I would say that uh, from my point of view, uh, Uzbekistan uh, entrance uh, to the European the Eurasian Union may be very interesting in the, uh, in the sense that it can become, I would say, a huge um, 
force a huge effort to change the rules of the game because actually i would say very frankly that moscow is quite interested in enlarging the sphere uh, and as far as we know uh, the ukrainian colleagues are of course opting out of the, of the region from the very beginning the recent uh, unrest in belarus also questions uh, the future for belarus membership uh, the Armenian, our Armenian um, colleagues are quite disappointed uh, by the Russian position in the Karabakh conflict. So I think that on the Western flank, it might be more and more uh, tensions uh, inside the Eurasian Union. So therefore, if Uzbekistan rises as a power from the Middle Asia, from, from the Central Asian front, which can influence Russia to change a little bit the rules and to make it more competitive, to make it more flexible, to offer more, uh, I would say, advantages to the new members. It, it can change, I think, a lot in, in this union because um, the newcomer, any newcomer can uh, ask and can you know, uh, make um, a claim for changing, uh, change, for changing rules of the game a little bit. The last point mm -hmm. I would like to, to, to make here is about you know, you mentioned in the very beginning uh, about the labor issues. Uh, everybody said about the migrant labor from uh, Central Asia to Russia. It's very important and I completely agree that this may be a very huge chance for Uzbekistan, you know, to legalize uh, it, uh, its um, migrant workers inside Russia and it would be a very good idea. But also, I wouldn't say that I uh, would all would uh, um, bet a lot on the qualified, high qualified labor from Russia because actually I would say if compared to the Central European countries, uh, the engineer work uh, uh, or high qualified uh, labor force from Russia is extremely overvalued uh, inside Russia and its qualification is not so much uh, so, so, so great as it appears from outside. So I doubt that uh, Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan or other Central Asian republics can benefit a lot uh, from attracting high qualified labor from Russia. It will be a very difficult issue, and I wouldn't say it will produce uh, the results you can imagine or you hope for. Okay, thank you, thank you. I think I think now we need to listen to our last panelist representative of Kazakhstan on the on the issue, and basically we are united. Uh, we are you. I mean, I am adding the third question to the second because we run out of time. And uh, Kasim Han, would you please uh, elaborate on this uh, on, on this question of uh, trade barriers, tariffs and non-tariffs, uh, which Kazakhstan uh, faced while joining the Eurasian Economic Union? We also need to make a note that uh, Kazakhstan was the only uh, and Belarus was the two members that haven't been the members of WTO by the time they, ex uh, uh, they joined the Eurasian Economic Union. But I think you, you will be able to tell us more about this. Yes, thank you, Tatiana. Uh, on the barriers, I will try not to uh, repeat my uh, previous speakers. So first of all, for Kazakhstan's case, one of the uh, indirect barriers was the uh, size of the value added tax because in Kazakhstan it's the lowest in the Union uh, right now it's 12 percent and uh, as per my knowledge uh, for other countries is around 20 percent so basically uh, this uh, barrier is um, it has an impact when uh, this amount of tax is being repaid by the state budget to the exporters. And that can be seen as one of the supporting measures for the exports. Um, then uh, another um, barrier connected with the financing is uh, that within the uh, some member countries, uh, namely in Russia, for example, there is a, a stable source of funding for exporters for uh, lower interest rates um, and that also makes uh, uh, makes a good uh, advantage for the Russian uh, companies entering foreign markets. Uh, again, uh, the cheap financing from the state, which is available in uh, Russia and Kazakhstan, is also uh, boosting the advantages of the local companies. 
Um, then the competition level, of course, in uh, surveys that was done for Kazakh companies, 66% uh, or two thirds uh, of all companies, they pointed out on the competition level as to be a barrier because of uh, high intensity of competition on uh, mainly Russian market and uh, also uh, in Belarus. Uh, lack of information is another indirect barrier for Kazakh businesses who is trying to do business in uh, union member countries. And uh, so they basically they, they are not familiar with the uh, local uh, business community and uh, maybe local business opportunities. Uh, then again, the currency exchange rate fluctuations, uh, they also posing a barrier, for example, in case of Kazakhstan in 2015, uh, when uh, Russian ruble has been devalued. Um, uh, in, so it, it, basically the value has declined twice and uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakhstan Central Bank was trying to uh, adjust the currency level, but it took uh, the Central Bank of Kazakhstan around 10 months to adjust the level. So basically we saw that uh, that was one of the uh, striking uh, examples of uh, increased competition from Russia. And we saw a lot of uh, Russian goods entering the Kazakhstan market for the first time. Uh, another uh, barrier that was al already discussed is uh, public procurement, of course, in the case of uh, Russia and Kazakhstan, it's quite a big chunk of economy. Uh, also sanitary and phytosanitary measures are considered to be non-tariff barriers as well. In case of Russia, I would also point out on uh, transport, on transportation, especially the railroad tariffs. Uh, well, this is a direct, uh, you could say, uh, it, 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 it's non-tariff, but also can be seen as a tariff barrier uh, in terms of moving uh, Kazakh goods within Russia. So basically, we uh, th there are still negotiations on uh, letting Kazakhstan uh, get uh, the same treatment as uh, companies in in, the, in Russia. And uh, last but not the least, I would say that uh, given the current situation, we see that uh, the real, there are different anti-crisis measures uh, in member countries. So we uh, we see that in Russia, for example, uh, there is a direct support for businesses in order to maintain employment in Kazakhstan. It's uh, handing out cash to population. And uh, so I would say that these policy measures, they also uh, can distort this uh, effect of the trade union. And um, as um, on a positive note, I would say that um, as, as a reaction to this situation, Kazakh business has been quite active uh, or in, in order to lobby its interests uh, towards the Eurasian Economic Union and uh, the National Chamber of Entrepreneurs at Amiken, they actually uh, initiated the creation of Business Council of the Union uh, through which uh, the business um, problems could be addressed on uh, intra-government level. And uh, right now, within the National Chamber of Entrepreneurs, there is a, a regular committee commission that is uh, comprised of leading uh, business owners, representatives, and uh, the government representatives in order to discuss issues that could be uh, then uh, elevated to the uh, Eurasian Union Business Council. So this mechanism, so what, one of the lessons is that this uh, tool was not there from the beginning as the business council, but it uh, emerged eventually and very organically. And I would uh, encourage also to new, new members who are joining the union to start these uh, discussions with their local businesses beforehand and to establish this kind of mechanism. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Really very helpful. We just hope that we will not uh, get this announcement of joining as member by surprise as, as the announcement as, uh, was done with regards of the announcing Uzbekistan joining as an observer. And the business community will actually have time to 
to discuss and negotiate along with the expert community. Uh, we are moving to our last question. It's like I will ask uh, each panelist to name the three main advantages or disadvantages of being the uh, member of the Eurasian Economic Union. And I will ask you to be very brief because we run out of the time. Uh, just, just name briefly and uh, tell why. And then we move to the Q&A session with the uh, participants. Thank you. And maybe we, Kasim Khan, maybe we'll start with you. If you're okay. Okay. Is yep, sure. Uh, thank you. So, um, so uh, actually, if, if it's okay, let me go after. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, then we will start with Zubita. No? <laughs> surprise, surprise. Okay, well, obviously, for um, plus, obviously, it's all conditional. I mean, it's a prerequisite that if uh, we hypothetically we assume that uh, the Eurasian Economic Union also improves and actually starts working as a more as, as more effectively, then for pluses we could say for Uzbekistan specifically, it's a nuance for Uzbekistan that elimination of discriminatory excise taxes and reduction of import duties, just like with the WTO in a um, negotiation process. So we. That's a plus. The second plus, again, it's conditional that uh, domestic reform on non-tariff barriers, including SPSTBT, which is very important for exports of horticulture products uh, and other products, and modernization of SPS and TBT systems, uh, just like with WTO. And, um, and uh, third plus, if all above mentioned are met and WTO session proceeds, and, and hypothetically, there may be an increase in investments, but it's all conditional, of course. And, and for the minuses, it's uh, obviously trade diversion limited by EU market. Uh, uh, if exemptions under the WTO session process, Uzbekistan gets exemptions like Kazakhstan did, then rules of origin again become very important and still matter. So border checks and delays would still be present, and um, uh, which undermines the freedom of movement of goods anyway. And the minus also that the exports for Horticulture products and processed foods will not increase automatically, uh, subject to many controls since the EU standards are not harmonized, as not yet fully harmonized with international still. And there's still reliance on end product certification within the Eurasian Economic Union as well. So SPS measures adopted as technical regulations, which is not compliant with WTO and which limits and may limit, of course, uh, prospects for development of standardization in Uzbekistan according to international standards as, as was mentioned here it's quite uh, backwards actually in the original economic union and the third minus obviously the investments will not increase automatically because need to improve investment climate with all above full-scale like uh, economic uh, and trade reform uh, with tangible changes and uh, sanctions against Russia and counteract uh, sanctions of Russia significantly of course impact access to technologies and pace of development for high-tech telecom and other high technological industries and may isolate Uzbekistan further from major developed countries cooperation and political factors still definitely play a role and we cannot avoid that and Russian involvement in wars in Ukraine and political unrest in Belarus and conflict in Armenia do not add to predictability and sustainability of trade policies. Thank you, Umida. We now move to the uh, to Mr. Khachatran to, to elaborate on these three advantages and disadvantages Armenia gained when joining the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, thank you, Tatiana. Thank you. And uh, when we discussing the problem of Eurasian Union, I mean, it was in before 19, uh, 2015. We talking about the political situation in Armenia, because we understand, we know that uh, <clears throat> many of the problems of Armenia coming from political situation, uh, uh, not only for economic, economic situation in Armenia. And now when we became a member of uh, this union, uh, we're thinking that we maybe, uh, with, with the help of the member of union, 
we can change the situation. We can change the situation, the economic situation, and by the help of economic situation, change the political situation. But until now, it is not working. It is one of the my uh, mind about this uh, situation in Armenia and about the uh, economic uh, Eurasian Union. But the main challenges of integration of the, this union are first weakening of the attractiveness of the economic model of Russian development as a center of attraction for integration ties in the Eurasian Union. Uh, Vladimir talking about this, and it is the, one of the main problem, but it's, maybe it is not problem. Maybe it is a privileges for us, but we, uh, every, the other members of uh, Without Russia will be understand that the, if you want to uh, work with this uh, union, with the cooperated with all of uh, the other countries, we uh, sometimes we don't uh, forget about uh, that. Remember, don't forget about Russia. We just remember the other countries. I mean, the cooperations with uh, Kazakhstan, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, because we understand that all of us, all of these countries, just work with only with Russia, and they have a big uh, co economic connections with Russia be during Soviet Union and after Soviet Union and uh, during became as uh, CIA uh, uh, as a CIA members but uh, now maybe we need to uh, cooperate closely with the uh, between uh, countries not only with Russia and the uh, second problem is bureaucratization and efficient efficiency of so supranational bodies because we now we created uh, uh, Euro-Asian commissions and we just thinking, they uh, thinking about cooperation uh, for these countries, members of union, but they forgetting about this situation in the countries in third. We don't forget about the two second problem. And the last, uh, what I mean, is the lack of real joint infrastructure product, projects focuses on the development of industrial cooperation, support for national producers of the UAE member states. I think enough. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I received a note from Captain Hanka Parva that he is ready to list his top, top three advantages and disadvantages. Please, Captain Han. Thank you. Um, well, uh, let me just point out on several um, topics that I think will be useful. Um, one of which is uh, just recently in May this year, uh, there was a discussion of um, the highest Eurasian Economic Council, uh, at which uh, Pre Kazakhstan's President Tokayev he uh, suggested that the uh, Union's uh, de development strategy till 2025 should be uh, the adoption of this strategy should be postponed until uh, the, the member countries could, fa uh, could meet face to face. And uh, basically we are seeing the slowing down of the uh, integration processes. And uh, it's, uh, I would say it's inevitable because at the beginning it was uh, not very detailed, but uh, as we go further, um, there, there are more and more details that are required to be um, defined and discussed and agreed upon. Uh, the second point I, I could I would mention is that um, within the Union, uh, most of the initiatives they are coming from Russia because um, Russian business community is more advanced. They have uh, uh, more um, access to global markets and maybe their um, demand for global standards is higher. So basically, we're talking about uh, the recent initiatives uh, connected with the product labeling. Um, this initiative is coming from Russia, and it's uh, very... Uh, so the business community in Kazakhstan is, is uh, not very excited about this uh, initiative, even though it started from just uh, two or three groups of uh, goods. But uh, later on, uh, the plan is to extend this um, product labeling. Uh, in Russian, it's called Markirovka Tavara. And um, as per um, uh, ev evaluation of its impact on the economy, so the 
local business community is uh, calculating that it would add up around 10% to the price level on these goods, and basically it will translate into the inflation. Um, maybe also some of the goods will not be available in Kazakhstan because of this initiative, uh, so the uh, global majors could withdraw from the market. And the third uh, pain uh, center, I would say, is uh, that any topic which relates to subnational currency or subnational financial institution is causing a lot of allergy both in the government of Kazakhstan and uh, the population because um, currency is seen as one of the key factors of independence and uh, maintaining independent state policy. So any um, speculation or any uh, citing of officials um, regarding uh, this uh, common uh, subnational currency is causing a lot of uh, uh, stress for the population. So the image of the union is not uh, is not benefiting from these kind of discussions. So that's the three main uh, points I would I would bring mm -hmm. to your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. We, uh, I think we will do it in the following order. We will we will uh, I will ask to manage Beksa Galiev to elaborate and we'll finish with uh, the Vladislav and Azemsa. Manage Bek, could you please list the top three topics of the uh, Kyrgyzstan and Eurasian Economic Union? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I will talk uh, uh, about the positive effects uh, firstly. Uh, the main positive effects may be uh, being the member of uh, Eurasian Economic Union, not only we talk about the goods and, ser goods and service, but also a free movement of the uh, labor, free movement of the capital, and etc. And uh, from this point of view, uh, employment topic of employment of our Kyrgyz citizens who are mostly low-skilled labor, it's very, uh, they can easily be employed on the territory of the big economies like Russia and Kazakhstan. Uh, so the topic of the employment is one of the most positive uh, effects of the uh, joining being the member of the union. Second topic is uh, uh, side effects. It's like uh, indirect effect of the joining of the union is uh, uh, shipment of the uh, economy from bazaar economy to the production and processing economy. Uh, and this is second and third uh, one is uh, uh, Russia, in order for the transition period, in order to make to get prepared Kyrgyzstan for joining the Union, they established a big uh, Russian Kyrgyz Development Fund. Uh, this uh, it's it's financial institution, which has uh, uh, very favorable interest rates for the business. Uh, this fund was uh, uh, established in order to make uh, Kyrgyzstan business get prepared for the Union. Uh, which, uh, in order for the Kyrgyz business to be oriented from bazaar economy to the more processing and production economy. It's a third uh, positive effect. And the uh, negative effect, I, I, I could say, uh, it's maybe more political, uh, political, political issue, political topic. Uh, you know that uh, for every country, it's logical uh, for big economy members like Kazakhstan for Russia, for Belarus, uh, for, for them uh, to make their economy uh, getting uh, bigger, they will, they will uh, protect their own uh, producers and their own businesses. So Kyrgyzstan, you know, uh, being this, it's uh, not secret, it's uh, one of the uh, smallest and one of the weakest economies of the Union, uh, they can be dictated from other big uh, big players of the union. So it's maybe it's this kind of political uh, issues, political questions, uh, plays a, uh, I think this major role uh, in terms of negative effects of the being the union member. Thank you, thank you. And uh, the, uh, the last panelist for today, the last in the last question, Vladislav Nazianzov, would you please uh, conclude the event with, the, with your final notes on uh, the advantages and disadvantages? 
Okay, look, uh, I will be brief. Uh, first of all, I would say that the, mo uh, the minuses, yeah, the problems. Uh, first is that uh, Russia geopolitically is now uh, not in a very good position because the Russian leadership uh, actually uh, wants to go further in its confrontation with the Western powers. And so therefore it will definitely affect somehow the economic stance of the country and all the sanctions which Russia can face will automatically in one or another fashion uh, somehow to be absorbed by uh, the Eurasian Union uh, countries members as well. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it takes from uh, transit issues to technology issues and to many others. The second point is actually our friend Kasim Khan said uh, about the uh, single currency. I actually doubt it will, uh, uh, it will be the case for coming five or 10 years. But nevertheless, the problem is that inside the Eurasian Union, the Russian ruble is actually de facto is a reserve currency. And I wouldn't say it seems now to be a very strong currency at all. So uh, Russia faces a lot of problems because of its payment balance, uh, because of the fall in energy prices. So therefore, it's actually not very good situation when uh, the, all the currencies are pegged uh, to ruble because it's not so, you know, so stable as, for example, the renminbi or the US dollar. The third issue, which was never mentioned here, but I think it's quite important, it's the, uh, diminishing, uh, the diminishing um, freedom, uh, technological freedom in Russia. Because, for example, in the recent two years, uh, more than 160 measures and um, laws were enacted in Russia limiting the freedom of the internet. And so, uh, therefore, uh, the technological infrastructure in Russia may be in a state of decline. Because, for example, if one can mention the you know, Western companies uh, are actually cancelling the SSL certificates from the Russian internet side. For example, Russia is only one country in the world where the site of the president, the Kremlin.ru, is not secure at all without the SSL certificate, uh, as are many of the other Russian official sites. So the Belarusian internet companies, which were actually moving from Belarus, we are not moving only because of this unrest, but because they expect uh, the new wave of you know, the Russian influence on the Belarusian internet sector. And therefore, in general, internet technology is actually endangered in any country which teams up with Russia. Uh, so, um, and the pluses, uh, the benefits are, of course, the um, poss possible extension. Uh, you know, possible growth of exports uh, for, to the Russian market. Uh, actually, the labor movement, which was mentioned many times. And I would once again say that Uzbekistan, as a potential newcomer, uh, definitely has some kind of uh, political lever to influence Russia to change something, some kind of rules for itself. Because uh, as one knows, for example, when China entered the WTO, it you know, was very successful in promoting uh, some kind of exceptions for itself, which were actually very beneficial for Chinese economy for years. So if Uzbekistan decides to join, I would advise its leadership just in order to make a lot of trade off with Russia as a new joining member. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have several questions uh, and I think you answered them in the chat, but I will, I will just, uh, for the, we still have seven minutes left before conclusion. And uh, the first question, question from uh, Nikolai Yarmo, Yarmov, it's our advisor, but also USAID project. If all the Eurasian Economic Union countries, except Belarus, are already members of the WTO, what's the difference advantages of the becoming uh, an uh, Eurasian Economic Union member? Do we have a vol volunteers to answer the, the, those questions? That question, because it's like, I think, to, to the panel. I answered already. Yeah, you answered already that, uh, yeah, could, you, could you please repeat or? Could... I can ask Tatiana about Yeah, can sure. I, can I ask this question because it's a very interesting question. And uh, for example, for Armenia, after the MB, when Armenia became the member of this union, the prices of energy resources became 30% uh, yes. 
uh, than before there when Armenia was the, without. And some uh, it's same situation was uh, for the, uh, diamonds produce produ uh, diamonds when Armenia imported from Russia. It increased the prices increased about thirty percent. It was very useful for Armenia and it's very uh, important for Armenia that you know that Armenia, for example, 100% uh, of energy resources rep uh, imported from uh, Russia. I mean, oil of uh, gas. It's a diff it's a, uh, main reason why uh, after, after they became member of this union, uh, what's the difference between WTO. But uh, the other problem, uh, I, uh, the big other sites, the many of the goods imported from the third countries, the prices of these goods increase, but not so much. It's about maybe one, two percent. It is that uh, we, as a, uh, citizens of Armenia, doesn't. Uh, not, it is not uh, was very important for us as a cons consumers. I think uh, it means that uh, after this rising uh, uh, tariffs, the prices did not change so much. Thank you, thank you. We have, uh, we have it. Yes. Just a couple, uh, say, I just want to say that I, uh, theoretically, ideally, RCA's regional trade agreements, which is also, EAU is also a regional trade agreement, uh, intended to uh, sort of even to deepen the integration, you know, compared to the general WTO. Um, uh, membership. So most, uh, all of the mem WTO members are in some sort of RT, uh, trade agreements. Mostly it's 99%, there are over uh, 500 RTAs in the world, 99% are free trade agreements. So EU is the only example of actually economic union, like a customs union, effectively, you know. And, uh, and EAU in that sense, yes, there are some uh, attempts in uh, Latin America, with Mercosur, there are some attempts in Africa, but they, they cannot compare to EU effectiveness, of course. They're not really, they also kind of failed uh, customs union, to be frankly speaking, you know. So EAU is quite an ambitious project. And in fact, indeed, the whole idea of regional trade agreements like free trade agreements is to deepen the integration by uh, getting into more, uh, uh, for example, the mo mo um, most cases, the investment provisions, you know, in such FTAs worldwide, I mean, intellectual property rights, provisions or deeper sort of integration on some uh, uh, dispute settlement etc which is not present right now at the region so we're not really taking advantage of even FTA within CIS frankly speaking so it's a fair question because uh, if we cannot even uh, deeper have uh, it means that structural economies are we're still like the kind of competitors we're not really um, we're doing the same thing basically you know instead of really integrating so in that sense it uh, seems uh, as, as uh, Blizislav already mentioned it's more sort of a political project rather than economic okay thank you Mida we have another question from Gregory Gleason the member of the American Chamber of Commerce this is an excellent informative workshop considering uh, Mr. Nazemsev and Ms. Haknazarova Observation about sanctions, does Uzbek entry into full status of Eurasian Economic Union member imply the European and American sanctions will extend to Uzbekistan automatically or will there be a waiver? Umida, I think it's you. No, I don't. I think that uh, Russian, uh, uh, san uh, well, sanctions against Russia, they're ag not against Eurasian Economic Union, like for example, we already had that uh, practice with, uh, with uh, counter sanctions of Russia for food products from EU and of course like other members were not you know agreeing to that and Kazakhstan wanted to import as usual and then so that they introduced actually customs control for rules of origin you know to avoid uh, re-export of EU products to Russia through Kazakhstan for example or through Belarus so it means that no it's not automatically against all the members of course it does and I don't think it's automatic but there is a risk that the there's sort of info you know the po in policy in politics there's all, all, all also this kind of um, uh, re fear and risk that politically uh, there may be isolation 
you know, if, uh, if there's more isolation in Russia, like more inward kind of oriented policy, there may, there may be implications for mem um, Uzbekistan or other member states, you know, there is a risk, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mida. Do we have other? No? Okay. We had another question to uh, Vladislav, uh, and I think it, it was uh, read, uh, answered and written. I just still, uh, still like uh, make it uh, like pronounce it. What is the conclusion in the sense of the functioning of Eurasian Economic Union under what circumstances it can be effective of the idea itself is doomed? Uh, I, 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 I should repeat it. So, look, yeah, uh, I think I, because not everyone has, I think, seen it. If you, yeah, if you could just repeat yeah, it yeah, and I'm then we'll sure. conclude. Yeah, the, the, the problem with the Eurasian Union actually is that uh, it, it might be quite effective if the leaders of the countries uh, decide uh, to allow the Eurasian Commission uh, and to the court of the Eurasian Union just to proceed uh, in a manner uh, as the European uh, uh, as the European Court of Justice and the European Commission proceeds, because actually uh, the idea of integration, uh, from my point of view, and Umida said about this about the Eurasia, uh, European Union, is to uh, make a framework for self-developing integration, and then actually to allow uh, the institution of the community or of the union uh, to go forward. And this is the, the, the biggest issue because. If integration doesn't doesn't actually uh, produce anything except of this council of heads of states, it's not an integration; it's just an in, in the international grouping, nothing else. Actually, it it should go uh, by itself for in, for at least uh, in at least several uh, several, several spheres. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we just uh, need to conclude our event and uh, I want to thank, uh, we learned today that, I mean, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union uh, is uh, not, uh, it's as, as many other integration initiatives globally, economically, economically is not really feasible. There, are, there, are, there must be other reasons for the integration and for the creation of this uh, union and it's like political, social, economic, uh, security and others. That's why countries join. But uh, today we were talking about economic and financial uh, reasons for integrating. So may maybe there will be another event on the on the on the other reasons of the, of the Eurasian Economic Union uh, existence. And I want to thank uh, all panelists for finding time to join the discussion. Very interesting discussion indeed. I want to I want to thank other participants for joining and. Uh, uh, for members of AMCHAM, you received and those registered received all the papers, but. Uh, the uh, others who didn't have chance to receive just write to me and we have uh, the five research uh, research from the distinguished panelists thank you again so much it was really informative uh, as, as well as reading your papers and um, i think we are done for today thank you and uh, enjoy your evening or day thank you